Um, so a title examiner, once we get the contract, uh, we send it up to the title company and a title examiner will be the one that conducts the, the search on the property. Um, and they're looking for a few things. One, the chain of title. Uh, is the person who signed the contract the, the person that actually owns the property? That's as foundational as that. So, uh, but not only that, I also want to see the chain of title, how, how they acquired title. What was the deed that vested them with the property? What about the, the one before that? Um, so depending on whether it's a purchase contract or a sale contract, uh, it's going to depend on how far back they go on that title search. But um, it, you know, in either case, we're looking to see who is it that owns the property. Uh, another thing that's going to, to be checked is the legal description. That is that little, it being all, all the buildings and improvements there on, if you've seen on in the middle of a deed, sometimes it's attached on the end as an exhibit A. Uh, but that's the, that's what transfers, uh, the property, to the purchaser. So, you know, just because a contract says from Joe to, to Jim, um, what's described in that legal description is, is what the property being conveyed is. And so that's going to be usually a lot and block description, which you guys can see. Um, those are called brief legals, uh, where it has an abbreviation uh, often on uh, the land records, the taxes, uh, but the full legal description is what's going to need to be on that deed. Uh, and then oftentimes you'll see meets and bounds descriptions. There's still plenty of properties that are, you know, starting at the old oak tree at the corner of, you know, block and fifth to, and then tracing the boundaries. You've got certain uh, where they'll call out a hundred feet back running parallel to this street and uh, making a right turn. Um, so all of that's going to be uh, verified on the title search. Uh, you're going to be looking for liens. Uh, title company is going to see, okay, what uh, the most common lien is a deed of trust. What mortgage does the seller have on the property? Uh, but also going to be looking for judgments. Uh, has anybody sued uh, the current owner and, and obtained a judgment against the property? Uh, things that are show up will also be neighborhood housing municipal liens. So uh, weed liens, that's something that came up this week, actually. Uh, sometimes when people let their uh, lawn go too long, the city comes by and says, hey, we'll cut that for you and uh, charge you a hefty price to do that. Uh, also for things like trash removal, we'll see that. Um, HOAs, condos, uh, they'll also have liens uh, occasionally. If they're not paid, they'll put a lien on the property. So the checker for that. Tax liens, IRS, uh, Virginia Department of Taxation, um, UCC financing statements. Sometimes you'll see uh, somebody's installed a water softener and uh, Culligan or whoever it is that installed it will want to secure their interest. And oftentimes folks are not even aware of this. Uh, it's when the title search is done that, oh, this is actually a lien against the property and it yep, has to be paid off at closing. Uh, and then all, lastly, the real estate taxes and uh, stormwater fees also act as uh, a lien against the property. Um, and then also for uh, easements and restrictive covenants, so often there are agreements um, that are recorded with the plat itself when the, the plat is put to record for the whole neighborhood or section of the neighborhood, whatever it is, um, you know, showing for utilities, drainage, uh, ingress and egress, uh, common areas. So if there's a park and there's a pathway that, that walk, uh, runs along the property, uh, all of that will be put to record. And uh, things like that that are put to record are, are deemed to what's called run with the land. So that means a new purchaser takes the property subject to those existing items uh, on record. Um, condo, yeah, so was, I mentioned that. Navigation, uh, so you'll see that as well. So that's step one, the title search. Um, step two is the actual title search, our title insurance commitment. So once that search comes back for a buyer side, uh, the title company is going to issue what's called a commitment where they say, hey, we will issue insurance on this property to cover the purchaser and their lender uh, under these certain conditions. And so this document actually binds the title insurer to, to issue the title policy once the requirements are met and the premium has been paid. 
uh, Schedule A. So part of that uh, commitment and getting into the weeds a bit, but just so you're familiar uh, at the closing table when we go over this, Schedule A shows the who the title is vested in, uh, the description of the property, proposed insured parties, who the seller is, who the purchaser is. Um, and something we're always checking for is, you know, is this a married couple that uh, maybe where one person is purchasing the property, but they want their spouse to also own the property with them, but their spouse is not obligated under the mortgage. We see that plenty of times. Uh, some people purchase in a trust, some people purchase in an LLC. So it's very important in that commitment that the insurance company is bound to protect the proper parties. Uh, Schedule B, Section 1 are going to be the requirements. That's where the deed of trust is going to be listed. Uh, you know, property was um, encumbered by, and it'll show the original principal balance when the loan was obtained. Um, and so that, that puts, you know, once we provide that to the seller, it puts the obligation on them to provide a payoff for that document. Uh, and then Schedule B, Section 2 are the exemptions. So those are going to be the things that are, you know, showing up on title that the title company says, hey, any of the issues related to these items where they know about them. So they're not going to offer coverage to protect for those things like a um, uh, like an easement uh, or a road maintenance agreement. Um, so or a well use agreement, water agreement. Those are going to be things that if there's some issue with them, and that's and it's important to sort of investigate that at that point once the search comes back, once we receive the the commitment. Okay, well, let's let's take a look at these easements, and and you can get an idea by looking at property. Often you'll see it. You know, if there's a driveway it appears to be shared, a uh, pathway leading to the water. Uh, those are going to be things that you that will kind of tip you off to. Okay, there may be something in the land records that we need to take a closer look at. So then step three, um, once that commitment is obtained, the, it's provided to the seller's uh, attorney or title company for them to address any title defects. Um, and defects are you know, going to be things like an unreleased deed of trust. That's the most popular one. You'll, you'll hear about that where when the seller purchased the property, uh, they, the, the, their seller had a mortgage on the property that their title company was supposed to handle obtaining the release for, and it never happened. And uh, this one comes up weekly. Um, and, and oftentimes it's not gonna be an issue um, as long as that person bought title insurance because the first question is, okay, well, do you have your title insurance policy? And that policy is going to provide coverage for that unreleased deed of trust. Uh, judgments against the former owner. Those are going to be things that, that come up as well that uh, may have never been addressed. And so, um, you know, a lender is going to have an issue with loaning on a property that has a judgment out there. So that'll be something that has to get tracked down. Um, a deed signed by power of attorney, but the power of attorney is not a record. Occasionally that happens. Somebody signs by power of attorney, that power of attorney has to be recorded. Um, or it doesn't, you know, or if it doesn't authorize the sale of real estate. So if, if there's a power of attorney that's of record, but it doesn't provide the uh, agent with the ability to convey title on behalf of the principal, we're going to have an issue. Um, or if it's self-serving. So if somebody uses that power of attorney to convey title to themselves, uh, obviously some issues uh, there and, and, and some follow-up would need to be done. Uh, legal description errors. So sometimes we'll see this where uh, the, the lot and block that the seller purportedly owns was not conveyed to them. And they had a, they, they transposed some numbers, uh, put the wrong lot, put the wrong block. Um, those are going to be things that, that have to be addressed uh, prior to closing. Um, there's different ways to address those. We talk, I already mentioned the, the title insurance policy, the current owner's policy. So if when the, the seller purchased, and this is something obviously you want to make sure uh, to emphasize to your clients. And, you know, when that question comes, because we're going to send it out, say, hey, title insurance is optional. It's in the contract even that uh, they're going to have to, if they're getting a loan, they're going to have to purchase a policy that covers the lender. And then they'll have the option to purchase a policy that covers them. And, um, and so you, you'll be in an opportunity to our position to explain why that's important. Uh, a few hundred bucks protects you from having to hire a lawyer and have some of these issues dealt with um, five, 10 years down the road or whenever it is that you happen to you know, end up selling the property. Um, so if the seller has a current owner's policy, how, the, the seller's addressing it, if they have a policy, 
that's going to help because there's no additional liability. Oftentimes, we see most policies around here are written by Fidelity, under, underwritten by Fidelity. So the various uh, title companies and law firms that handle real estate, many of them use Fidelity, uh, which is, I think, the second or third largest title insurance company in the nation, uh, to provide insurance. So we we end up, you know, writing the policy, but it's it's actually underwritten behind uh, Fidelity. So if we have an instance where Fidelity insured at that point, there's no additional risk for Fidelity, uh, you know, to continue to insure in, in that instance, if it's something for an issue that happened, uh, you know, for a prior policy. Um, but something to remember, though, is that the buyer is not obligated or required to accept the indemnified title. So uh, just because we have a prior policy, uh, the buyer has the ability to say, I'm not okay with that. And, you know, I, that could still be an issue. I, I don't want it to, to be an issue. And, uh, you know, the seller has an obligation to convey clear title. And if they aren't able to convey clear and warrantable title, uh, the buyer is not obligated to close. Um, defects originating, originating with the seller. Sometimes we'll see um, debts that have been discharged in bankruptcy, but not released from the title. That's a big one. Uh, often folks file bankruptcy and are under the impression that, hey, you know, that this, this debt is no longer valid. This second deed of trust uh, was I obtained a discharge for it. Uh, but if that lien has been recorded prior to the bankruptcy, then even though they're not personally obligated, so the, the creditor can no longer collect against them personally, uh, they still have a lien against the real property. And this is often a surprise to find, uh, you know, folks that have filed bankruptcy to find out that, no, actually, no, you do need to pay off that $60,000 uh, second deed of trust at closing. Uh, unexpected judgments and tax liens, uh, sometimes folks are just unaware. I, I've never even heard of this. Service wasn't uh, properly obtained. Um, you know, they weren't aware that the, the tax lien was going to be recorded. Uh, so those are things that, that, that come up that a seller is going to be obligated to, to work on clearing up. Uh, UCC financing statement, I mentioned that. Replacement windows, water softeners, uh, those are things that you'll see those UCCs on. Um, and then also divorce severing tenancy by the entirety. So you have a couple that get divorced and one of them has a judgment against them. Once that final decree is issued, that judgment attaches to the property. Uh, you may have heard of this tenancy called tenants by the entireties with right of survivorship. So when a married couple uh, owns property, they can hold it with that tenancy and a creditor of just one of the uh, spouses does not, uh, you know, no judgment would attach against the property if it's held by T by E. Um, and so that's why it's important when, when we hear about folks that are getting a divorce and, you know, part of the decree says that one person's supposed to get the party or one person's supposed to get the house. It's always better to make sure that that deed taking the other spouse off title uh, is done before the divorce decree is issued in the event there are judgments uh, by one party. Um, because once they, once they are, are divorced, then, um, they're deemed to own the property as tenants in common and then judgments of either one would attach to the property. Um, so the, the way that, uh, owner defects are addressed one, uh, obviously obtaining payoffs, uh, mentioned that. So, uh, when there's a mortgage on the property, the, uh, you know, seller's attorney or title company will obtain a payoff for that. Um, oftentimes they'll have to get corrective deeds done if there's some issue with how the seller was conveyed property, uh, corrective deeds confirming, uh, you know, this is the transaction they, they correct, you know, whether the, the legal description was uh, wrong at that point. So everybody signs that to say, Hey, a deed of confirmation and correction. This is what we meant to do at that point. Um, you know, obviously the longer the property has been owned, the harder that is to, uh, to, to get, to make, to find those parties, you know, is everybody still alive at that point? Um, and if amounts of liens exceed the seller's anticipated proceeds, uh, sometimes the transaction has to be converted to a short sale. Uh, you know, the, the arguments can be made with the creditor. Look, you, you know, you won't, there's not enough money here to pay you. Uh, this is your only chance of, of looking to obtain payment. 
you, um, you know, if they don't agree to a payoff, then the property could end up in foreclosure and they get nothing. So those are, uh, you know, things that can get addressed. Uh, in that event, so if you're aware of a situation, somehow, you, you know, your, your client mentions that there are tax liens, they owe the IRS some money, they'll need to be aware that there'll be additional attorney's fees, title resolution costs in those instances, because that's outside the scope of basically our, our you know, our standard settlement uh, provision. So uh, that's something that you, know, you want to tip them off to. Also extending the closing date. Uh, nowadays, especially the IRS seems to be very, very slow with uh, communicating with folks. Um, so if you've got a, you know, three, four week close, and you know of an IRS lien on the property that, um, you know, preparing folks ahead of time, getting an addendum on, hey, look, let's, let's address this thing, give us an extra two weeks if need be. Now, the contract does provide for that, uh, that paragraph that allows the seller an automatic extension in the event of loan processing and title defects. Those are the two things that that covers. It doesn't cover picker repairs, that sort of thing, which is a common misconception. Um, but oftentimes that's going to be, if it's left blank, 10 days. And that may not be enough time, depending on the circumstances. Um, step four, the title insurance policy. So that part happens. We, we get to the closing table. The seller has met all the requirements. We've got the payoffs that we need. Everything looks good. Um, and so we get to the closing table and the, the buyer has agreed. Yep, I want title insurance. I see the value here. Um, so the premium is paid as part of the transaction. Uh, all the documents are signed. The requirements are met. Um, and then the, the title insurance policies are then issued. That takes about two or three weeks after closing because it, it has the deeds have to get recorded. Uh, the deeds of trust need to be recorded. The premiums need to be paid, sent in. Um, and so a lender's policy will be issued if they're getting a mortgage. And that only covers, provides the lender coverage in the event their deed of trust is found to be faulty uh, as a result of anything. Um, so it's going to cover them. And then the owner policy is going to cover the buyer against any unknown issues. Um, you know, and then we often get questions, well, why don't, why wouldn't we just call you guys? And, and, and I always say, yeah, absolutely. You definitely call me first, but there, you know, who's to say we'll be here. Um, you know, Fidelity has a longstanding reputation um, and much deeper pockets. So they, they, you know, you always want to have somebody with deep pockets on the hook in the event something goes go south. So um, that that's where that owner's policy comes in. It's going to cover the buyer against any un unknown issues, it's going to cover them against any mistakes that were made, things that were missed at the at the search and undiscovered undiscoverable title issues. Uh, you know, we we had an instance here in Virginia Beach not too long ago where uh, purchase uh, somebody purchased property in Sandbridge uh, the seller was in New York and uh, this, these properties, uh, two pieces of land right on the beach were sold. And turns out the seller had no knowledge of it. They started, uh, you know, just one point realized they didn't get the tax bill. The actual, the, the, the owner of the property realized they didn't get the tax bill. So they reached out and discovered, oh, actually somebody else owns this property now and is building a house on it. So uh, that's when the title insurance company steps in and, and folks are going to be covered in that instance. Uh, the types of owner's policies, there's two types. There's a standard and enhanced policy. Uh, the standard is, as it sounds, it's the basic policy, whereas the enhanced provides a little bit extra coverage there. Um, standard is only available to folks that are uh, purchasing investment properties, second homes, um, whereas an enhanced is going to cover, it has to be a primary residence to get the enhanced. And so there's going to be a few additional items on the enhanced policies. It's going to cover, you know, force removal of structures that encroach over boundaries or into easements. So there's a shed or a pool in a VEPCO easement. Um, the enhanced policy is going to provide some coverage in those instances, whereas a standard policy wouldn't. Um, it's also going to, the enhanced coverage is also going to increase uh, with inflation up to 150% of the policy. So they own this, this is their forever home. They own it for, you know, however long the, as the property increases in value. So will the coverage extended under that policy, whereas the standard coverage is only going to be limited to what is actually uh, the property value at the time of purchase. Um, the cost of title insurance, if that's a question that folks have, there is a calculator. So it's all just based on the sales price. 
Uh, so it's going to depend on how much money they're borrowing, how much they're paying for the property. And we can get quotes for that. So if folks have questions and they want to know, well, what, you know, how much is this going to cost? Uh, they can reach out to us and we can run it through the rate calculator to find that out. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically it. Oh, and I, I will touch on the, the contract provisions. So paragraph 7C, the seller does in the rain contract, the seller does represent that they own good and marketable title uh, to fee simple interest in the property. They have the right to transfer the property without obtaining consent or approval of any other party, including judgment creditors, lien holders, or other lenders, or any uh, court, including bankruptcy court, and that they are or will be in a position to transfer title to the property uh, to the buyer free and clear of all liens. Uh, paragraph 7F says that if any representation by the seller is materially untrue, then the seller shall be deemed to be in default. So if the seller is unable to convey clear title to the buyer, they are in default of the contract at that point. Um, and then paragraph 9A provides that the seller conveys marketable insurable title to the property by general warranty deed. Um, the two types of deeds you'll usually see is a general warranty deed. That's the most common. That's what's in the rain contract. And that's a seller saying, not only do I provide, uh, you know, I, I'm warranting this title. I'm saying this title is good, not again, not only against things that may have occurred while I own the property, but from the beginning of time, I guess, or whenever, whenever the property, uh, you know, came over from from London, I guess, on some land grant there. Um, so that that's a general warranty deed. It's obviously very broad. Um, sellers can feel confident signing that and conveying title by general warranty when they themselves have purchased an, an owner's policy. Um, but that's going to be in the standard contract that they have to provide a general warranty deed. Um, and it has to be uh, free and clear of all liens, tenancies, encumbrances. Um, so a seller cannot simply terminate the contract just because there is a title uh, defect on the search. So, uh, you know, if they didn't know that they'd have to pay that IRS lien off, they can't decide, you know, never mind. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to sell, or I'm going to try to sell to somebody who doesn't mind taking title subject to this IRS lien. They, they do not have the ability to do that. Um, but the buyer can, of course, terminate if they decide that they don't want to take property subject to, you know, any issue that's out there. Uh, and, and also, if the seller ends up being in default, they could be uh, responsible for the buyer's appraisal, home inspection fees, the costs incurred in, in doing their due diligence on the property. So um, that's kind of a general overview on title, uh, why it's important. And of course, anybody ha ever has a question, if you have a client that has some questions, of, why do I need to buy title? I read online that, you know, it's a, you know, whatever. Um, Definitely encourage them to, to get in touch with me. I'm sure many of you have stories um, of folks that needed or where a title insurance policy came in handy. Um, and but there, you know, if, if you don't, then it, it helps to get somebody else's story. So uh, for a long time, I used to borrow somebody's stories until I actually sat down with somebody who had an issue and uh, where we had to point out that. You know, this is the kind of thing that title insurance would have covered. And uh, even though you're showing me this line item here that says lenders title insurance, that only covers your lender. It does not cover you. It's an often a sad case, but uh, it is helpful to have a story at points. So uh, that's that's title, all things title there. Um, any questions from anybody on any of those items or anything else? I have a question. You guys can have a question. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I'm ready. Um. Is it common for a property to have a lien and the homeowner has, has no idea that there is a lien in the property? It, it does happen. Um, we had an instance just recently where uh, somebody was selling their rental property. So they were living in Tennessee at the time. Uh, the rental property was here in Suffolk and uh, they had hired a contractor to do some work on the property. And the contractor just completely botched it up, just did a horrible, horrible job, um, so much so that he ended up having to hire another contractor to come and finish the job. And um, that original contractor felt like he was owed money. So he ended up suing the, uh, the, the seller in this instance because it all came up uh, you know, as, as part of the sale. The contractor sued them, but they, they served them 
at the property at the property that, that there was a rental so the 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 sheriff came by taped it to the front door um you know and, and either the tenant didn't let them know or maybe the property was uh, not uh, in, uh, you know pursuant to a lease at that point um but our seller found out about it uh, basically as a result of the title um search and um so yeah that was that was a big issue they had uh, judgment was taken by default and so there was a lien against the property and um we ended up in that case uh, we had other issues that, that came up with that but the uh, buyer side ended up uh, willing to escrow uh and hold money in their escrow account and allow the closing to take place while the seller worked on the issue because it's a void judgment if it, you know if anybody that's constitutional um you're we're entitled to notice and process of any uh, suits or actions that folks have against us. And if you, if you don't receive notice of the, the actual underlying uh, lawsuit, then that judgment of taken, uh, taken against you is void and uh, can be voided. So yeah, it is possible. Yeah. That... Uh, Austin, sir, can I ask a question, sir? Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. In terms of um, uh, trying to prevent a, uh, um, any vo voiding of any title, warrantable title insurance, because I know you mentioned Fidelity, and they do a lot of automobile warranties, and these, those can be voided with a lot of fine print. So, for example, like let's say uh, uh, Depot takes over a homeowner association or a condo association loses its rights as a condo, no fault to the owner of the owner of the unit. Um, would that void any title warranty or anything? Sir? No. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. No, the um, – and I, I think it's probably less common in the instance of um, – title insurance as it relates to land. Uh, okay. the difference, the difference on, on title insurance as it relates to land versus like warranties and, and other types of insurance. Uh, you know, when you buy homeowners, that's going to cover things that happen in the future, the okay. unexpected that arises, whereas a title insurance policy with uh, respect to real property is going to cover things in the past. So anything that happens in the future, you're, you're actually not going to get coverage uh, under that policy for those items, it's it, it's going to cover mistakes, things that were missed, that uh, you know, or a, you know, a, a forged deed. You know, the seller didn't actually own the property, um, and, and just given the nature of of land, it's so much harder to sort of ascertain, uh, you know, a piece of the earth's surface. I mean, who even you know the owner is. Whereas like a car or something like that, you've got you know you can look at it, you take it to a mechanic, check it out. Um, but, but so much with land, it's just going to be dependent on, okay, well, let's look at the land records. Let's see what's happened in the past. And, uh, you know, oftentimes things are missed, misspelled, misindexed. Uh, and so they don't come up on a search, um, you know, covers human error, you know, something was missed or, or that sort of thing. So any sort of change in a regime, um, yeah, it's not going to have, uh, you know, any sort of voiding effect on, on, uh, an owner's policy. Wonderful answer. Thank you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Anything else? You went over the whole explanation of a, a general deed, general warranty deed. Can you just do a quick overview of the special warranty deed and when that comes into play, please? Absolutely. So the, the special warranty deed is <clears throat> where the seller is saying, I don't know about anything that happens uh, before I own this property and I'm not going to provide any sort of warranty for that issue. It's only for the time that I own the property. So you see a special warranty deed in cases where, um, you know, foreclosure certainly is always going to be. So a bank owned property, <clears throat> trustee, something conveyed back to uh, the VA or HUD, they are only going to warrant um, title for the time that they they own the property. So from the time that deed was signed by the seller, the deed in lieu of foreclosure, from the time the trust time the trustee's deed um, occurred <clears throat> on, you know, conveying property to the the, the current owner. Uh, it's going to start at that point. And then from the time that they sign the deed to your buyer, they're given special warranty. So it's only for things uh, just that may have come up during during that period of ownership. Oftentimes also with estates, uh, if there's, especially if there's an attorney involved, um, you know, for a trustee or, or an executor of an estate, uh, will advise, especially, you know, for folks that we represent and say, hey, you know, you, you don't want to provide a general warranty in this instance because you have no obviously clue what uh, may have occurred while they own the property, the, the decedent, the person that had passed. Uh, so it just makes sense to go by special warranty. 
Um, nowadays, though, when when you have um, title insurance, you, you know, you're basically the you know buyer is if they're going to get a policy, um, then that policy is what's going to cover them for anything that may have occurred, not only during the time that the seller owned the property, but from before that. Um, so it's obvious, it, often not a not really a critical issue, but it's certainly in an instance where if you've got a party that's thinking about maybe I won't get title owner's policy, um, you know, you want to find out, OK, well, what what is the seller obligated to do in the contract? That's it's almost always going to be in the contract uh, you know, what the seller's obligation is for conveying title to the property. And if it is special warranty, that's just going to be something that you want to mention to them. Hey, you know, they're only going to provide coverage or they're only warranting the title for the time that they own the property. So uh, you're really in a lurch if, you know, something that, that comes up that was before they actually owned it. So, uh, and then so the other, I'll, I'll mention this too, quick claim. You hear about these occasionally. A quick claim deed is, I, I'm not even saying I own the property. I'll convey you whatever I own, if anything, in this property. And that's a, that's a quick claim. And that's, uh, we tend to try to discourage those. Um, you know, it's almost raising a red flag. Um, so it's, but yeah, you occasionally do see it. So if a buyer purchases a home with a special warranty deed, we need to recommend that they get title insurance and enhance title insurance because then they're on the hook to convey a general warranty deed, correct? Correct. I, I would okay. say, and not only in a special warranty, I'd say even a general warranty uh, standpoint, always want to get title insurance just because it's going to be cheaper. Uh, the title insurance policy is going to be so much cheaper than even getting to sit down and talk to an attorney oftentimes. You know, there's some issue that comes up when that buyer, when your buyer goes to sell their property, that's when it's going to happen. It's when they go to sell their property because another title search is going to be done. Oh, lo and behold, an unmissed, uh, you know, an unreleased deed of trust, whatever the case may be. Well, their de decision at that point is they're going to sue everybody, right? They're going to sue who handled their closing. They're going to sue the sellers. Um, but that, I mean, anytime litigation is involved, if anybody's ever been involved with it, it it's very expensive. Everybody bills hourly. It's, there's no contingency arrangements. It's not like when somebody slams into you at the uh, stoplight. And all the attorneys say, hey, you don't have to pay a dime because they know they're going to get paid in those instances. Uh, these are these are always cases, you know, anything related to land is going to be, uh, yeah, you need a retainer. And they're going to be billing hourly, plan on filling that thing up a few times. So, yeah, that's why title insurance is important. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Any other questions, guys? All right. Thank you, Austin. All I appreciate right. it. Always a pleasure. We'll see you guys next time. Always. All right. So what I wanted to show you real quick is a way that you can ensure that you're clear to pay so that it expedites you getting your paycheck really quick. Um, when I request it, at the last minute, it puts a lot on Lucy to have a chance to go through everything in your transaction. So if you go on your transaction and just, I'm picking one here, go to users and contacts, the action drop down button, send email. Then you're gonna pick who it's going to, all right, Lucy, you can also add additional people if you need to send it to more than one. You could send it to me. Let me know that this is going to close in the next day or two. And I've created a template. So if you go down here, it says use template right here. It says agent checking for clear to pay. It'll put the memo line, the address, asking for a clear to pay. You can add additional notes, sign your name, and send. This will send an email to whoever you've selected and bring it to their attention that you're ready for your transaction to be reviewed for clear to pay. Now, if it's new construction or for some reason there is no walkthrough, put the message in there bringing that to Lucy's attention. We receive an email, it has the property address saying you want us to check it for clear to pay. Uh, you can also send messages to us like, I just submitted a release. Can you please put my property back on the market ASAP? It just brings it right to our attention with an email. 
Um, so that's the quickest way to get that done. Any questions? Make sure, make sure that you guys are not waiting till the last minute. Make sure you have everything in prior to closing so that all that needs to be checked are the final documentations at the closing. Make sure that you are checking with Lucy and Paula that everything is in there. If not, make sure you get it. Do not wait until the end. It's still happening. It is still happening. We've been saying it for two years that I know of. Do not wait <laughs> until the end. Do not wait for It's not Carla's responsibility to get your clear pay. It's yours with Lucy. So make sure that you have it. We pay within 24 hours, but you have to have the documents in there in order for her to release it. Does anyone have any questions? If so, go ahead and unmute yourself. All right. Thank you, Carla, for that quick little training and for the template. I appreciate it. Um, one, of, one of the biggest things I'm seeing happen is I know you all are furiously writing contracts one after another, trying to get your buyers into places. But take a breath, and I think I said this last month, take a breath, take a moment, look at every checkbox and every blank on every page of that contract before you ratify it. It's going to take you less time to make sure that things are properly filled in and checked than having to go back and redo an addendum and get everybody to sign it. Some of the most common misses I'm seeing are the escrow agent, the name of the escrow agent, the title company or attorney that's holding your escrow, and the, the way that that money is being paid, whether it's a check, um, a wire transfer, or whatever. So take a minute, make sure things are fully filled out. It's going to save you the time of having to do an addendum and get it signed and uploaded and approved later. Also, on the heels of Carla and her clear to pay, I have been trying to go back through everybody's um, contracts. When you send me the walkthrough, I'm trying to go back through everything and clear it to pay immediately if you've got everything done without you even asking. So um, that walkthrough in there or the notification that a walkthrough is not available, your message, whatever, triggers me to try and go through and make that done make that happen for you as quickly as possible. But if, if I don't, if I miss it, if you don't see any notes anywhere, absolutely do what Carla said and send the email because there are, there's a glitch somewhere in Broker Mint and sometimes I am not getting notifications in my email that things are submitted. So until I go in and look at the whole list of everything, once something is in my email, I don't see some of those submissions. So if, if you don't he hear anything from me and you don't see anything and you think it's all done, absolutely use Carla's template and send an email because then you're going to be more assured that it's coming into my inbox. Um, that's pretty much it for this month. Next month, we're going to have new contracts, new laws, new situations. So it'll be a, bu it'll be a busy contract month next month. Does anybody have any questions for me? And once we have new contracts, Lucy will do another recording of the um, seller's contract and the listing contract. We'll do another recording of that to replace our old one as well. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs>